<laughs> My name is Stephanie. I'm the executive director here at the Sheldon. And we're really pleased to sort of, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you have had the opportunity to come join us for talks recently, but we've been focusing on bugs this year. Some might say you, some might say yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of in the middle of that spectrum, but we've had a great opportunity to learn more about some of the different types of insects that are here in the state of Vermont. And we're continuing that series today with Dr. David Allen, who is from Middlebury College. And his talk is going to focus specifically on ticks and the ecology of tick-borne diseases. And I had, to, I had to write this down because I'm a historian. He is interested in the abiotic and biotic drivers of tick-borne disease prevalence. Um, and he mentions that his ongoing work actually takes place right here in Addison County, Vermont. So there's a lot of really interesting things that we can learn about our local environment from him, I'm very sure. Um, and I also want to give a shout out and a thanks to Table 21 for sponsoring our public program. Also, several very generous donors have given us some funds to fund opportunities like this this summer and upcoming fall. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Allen. Thank, Thank you. you. Great, thanks everyone for coming. I'm really excited to give uh, this talk in this venue and uh, share the work that I've been doing um, for the last seven years studying ticks uh, in this region. So yeah, my name is David Allen. I'm a professor in the biology department up at Middlebury College. And um, yeah, we'll jump right in. So I want to give a brief outline of the talk. We're going to start with just a general um, biology of ticks. So we're going to think about what is a tick, some of the like basic things that, that, that make a tick a tick, and give us some background that we'll need for the rest of the talk to place my research in a bit more context. And just because ticks are, I mean, they're, they're very gross and horrible, <laughs> but they also have a very, very interesting biology. And so I think it's fun to sort of highlight some of that. Um, then we're going to focus in on the black-legged tick. And a black-legged tick is just another name for the deer tick. Um, so deer tick is used more commonly. There's some like historical reasons why entomologists prefer black-legged tick. But when I say black-legged tick, it's the same as the deer tick. And so we're going to focus in on this, the most common human biting tick in this region, and the tick that transmits Lyme disease. And so the one that we're going to be most worried about from like a human health perspective. Uh, and which has had this really dramatic change in its um, range over the last 20 years. And so for those of us who have lived in Vermont, you know, uh, we, we remember a time when there, there wasn't any black-legged ticks, that we didn't really worry about Lyme disease as much, and now I want to understand why that change has happened. And in order to understand how that change has happened, I want to put the black-legged tick in its ecological web of interactions to think about what's changed that's caused the black-legged tick to change. And that'll lead in directly to my research. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the biology of ticks. Um, so ticks are a group of arachnids. So they're not actually insects. They're, um, lo sorry, Stephanie. Uh, they're most closely related to, um, to spiders and scorpions and mites. So they're in this group of arthropods, uh, like insects, but they have uh, four pairs of legs rather than three pairs of legs. But they have a hard exoskeleton, and so they share a lot of traits with insects, but um, uh, actually uh, not an insect. Um, they're found in most regions of the world, so almost anywhere you go in a terrestrial, on land, you'll find uh, some ticks. There's about a thousand species. So this is actually not very many if you compare it to spiders, where there's like 50,000 species of spiders or beetles. 400,000 species of beetles, um, ants, bees. There's way more of those other um, groups of arthropods. So sort of interesting that this is an ancient group. We'll talk about how old it is, how widely distributed it is, but they, for whatever reason, don't have a ton of species. But all of these, about 1,000 species of ticks, are obligate blood feeders. So ticks, all of these ticks, all they ever eat is blood. Um, and that's the only source of nutrition they're going to get through their whole life. Um, and this blood feeding happens on any terrestrial, meaning um, living on land, uh, vertebrate. So every class of or vertebrates, these are these sort of like four big groups of vertebrates, they all have ticks that feed on them. So we, we know about mammals uh, that, that uh, ticks feed on, but they also feed on birds, um, reptiles, and more rarely uh, amphibians. Uh, so here we can just see some of the diversity of ticks. This is a, um, a dog tick here that's on a blade of grass, uh, and it's uh, looking for a host. So it has this very 
clear behavior that we'll talk about, like waving its uh, first pair of legs around, trying to grab a host. This is the Lone Star Tick. We don't have this one here. It's found um, a little bit further south, uh, but also a tick that's had range expansion. Um, this is a really strange tick. It's called a soft back tick. We'll talk about these briefly soft back ticks, and here she's um, laying her eggs. So that's what those, uh, those spheres are there. I should say that um, there'll be definitely time at the end for questions, but if you, something really jumps out at you in the middle, I'm happy to take questions throughout as well. So we'll just briefly talk about the evolutionary history of ticks. I talked about them, a pretty ancient group, so there's evidence that they go back at least 200 million years, but this is a um, preserved tick that was preserved in amber. So ticks don't fossilize very well, so we don't have a great fossil record, but um, one way that we can get at, um, get at them is with these chants, um, uh, when they get preserved in amber that then will uh, stay for you know millions and millions of years. So this is a dinosaur feather. So uh, the dinosaurs led to the birds. Our birds are the descendants of dinosaurs. And some of these sort of like proto birds or dinosaurs that are going to lead to the birds had feathers even before they became birds. Um, so this, this tick here uh, was preserved with this uh, dinosaur feather from 100 million years ago. So it's likely that this tick was, was feeding on a dinosaur. So even the dinosaurs 100 million years ago had to deal with ticks. Um, there's two broad groups of ticks. There's the hard body ticks and the soft body ticks. So here we have this um, black legged tick, also called the deer tick. So this is the main tick we're gonna be talking about today. It has this hard uh, sort of shield on its back. Um, but then there's another broad group of ticks that have this sort of like more leathery, soft skin. Um, and these are called the, the soft ticks. Uh, these more rarely bite humans, so you're not coming into contact with them as much. Um, but they have very distinct feeding and biology and behavior. Um, so I just want to say that most of what I'm going to say today is applying to the hard ticks. Um, and we're not going to really talking about uh, the soft ticks. But got to say that so I don't, you know, say something that's not true about the soft ticks. Um, so all hard body ticks uh, go through three life stages in their life. Uh, so this is a finger here with a black legged tick um, and we can see these three life stages sequentially. So they're born from an egg as a larva um, and interestingly these larvae only have three pairs of legs. So for some reason they don't have that fourth pair of legs as a larva. Um, this larva is going to take a, a blood meal, um, a single blood meal as a larva, and then molt to a nymph. So it uses that blood to molt to a nymph. That nymph will then take a single blood meal um, and then molt and turn into an adult. So at this point we can get a male adult or a female adult. Um, and then the female adult will take a third blood meal um, and then use all that blood to make eggs lay potentially two to 3,000 eggs, um, and then they're gonna hatch as larvae. So that's our life cycle here, where we have three distinct stages, and at each stage they take a single blood meal. So it's a little bit different than like a mosquito, uh, who will go out, she'll take some blood, lay some eggs, take some blood, lay some eggs, and she could do that for many, many cycles, but here we're feeding just once per blood meal, or per life stage, and then there's a long development phase in between. Um, and the length of time depends on uh, the species. Some species can do this life cycle faster or shorter, but it also depends on the temperature. So this tick has a broad range in Eastern North America. Um, and around here, this life cycle will take two to three years. But in South Carolina, the same tick can do that all in one year, just because it's warmer and the development is faster. Okay, so ticks are feeding on blood. That's their, only, uh, that's their only source of food. And so they have a very specialized anatomy um, that reflects this, this blood feeding. So what we're looking at is a beautiful um, scanning electron microscope image that was taken by one of my colleagues, uh, Jody Smith at Middlebury. This is a nymphal, or the, the nymph stage of the black-legged tick, and it's on its back. So we're looking at the, the underside of the tick and the, the top of it. So this is the first pair of legs, the base where they connect to the body, and then this is sort of like the head of the tick. Um, and what we're gonna talk about here are these feeding appendages. So it has a pair of palps, 
um, and then in the center, a hypostome. So these palps are predominantly sensory organs. So um, the little hairs on the palps are sensilia, or that they're sensing. Um, and maybe Greg talked about that with like the antenna of fireflies and, um, and wall, uh, ants, sort of similar here. These aren't antenna, but sort of functioning like it. And so then these sensilia are um, very sensitive at detecting changes in temperature, little puffs of air or vibration, carbon dioxide. So that's what ticks are sensing. Uh, this tick doesn't have any eyes, so it's blind, so it's just moving around the world, smelling carbon dioxide, feeling vibrations, feeling heat to try to find a host, and then once it gets on a host, find like a nice spot, like a warm, sheltered spot. Yeah? So, um, I, you said it twice now, quickly. The, the things that it's sensing to determine whether that's a place it wants to yeah. attach are temperature, Temperature, uh, vibrations or movement, and carbon dioxide. So it knows that we are breathing out carbon dioxide. And so if it can find a place where there's localized high concentration of carbon dioxide, that's a good sign that there's a vertebrate that's respiring and is healthy and okay, that's a good host to have. They probably sense other chemicals. Um, so they do have some sex pheromones so that they're also out there looking for a mate um, and they may sort of, some, some ticks are more um, species specific than others. So this is a very, a generalist tick. It'll feed on anything that comes by. A deer, a, a dog, a mouse, a human, but also a robin that's on the bottom of the, or a lizard further south. Um, but maybe some ticks that are more species specific are also smelling for cues of that species, but uh, that's not the case for this tick. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the palps are these cutting appendages. So before it's going to feed on you, it actually sort of slices into to the host's skin. Um, the, the palps then spread out, and the part that goes into the host is this nasty hypostome with these recurved teeth that helps it sort of like anchor into the host. Um, so ticks are, um, again, contrasting with mosquitoes, are what we call slow feeders. So they'll feed for days on the host. So maybe three days to a week, they're slowly imbibing all the blood that they need. Versus a mosquito, like it's buzzing around, it wants to suck on your blood for at most like 30 seconds before you swat it. So. These ticks have a very different strategy. They're gonna slow, feed really slowly, and so the blood is um, coming in a, through a channel in the hypostome, um, but then at the same time, they're alternating this blood sucking out by sending saliva in. Um, and the way that they can do this really slow, long feed is that they have this rich chemical cocktail, or cocktail of chemical compounds that are in their saliva that are like, uh, stopping your blood from coagulating, stopping an immune response, stopping your, you from like feeling them. Um, so it's actually really amazing chemistry that's, that's going on with this tick saliva. Um, uh, but unfortunately, because they're, they're, they're sending saliva into you while they're feeding, they're also very effective bloodborne pathogen spreaders. Um, and a lot of the pathogens that these ticks spread have had time to sort of co-evolve with the ticks. So Borrelia burgdorferi is the, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, and it has this sort of close history with the ticks. So it, it sort of knows in an evolutionary sense that I want to be in the salivary glands because then I'm going to get shot in to the next host. So it'll feed on a host, get Borrelia, then the Borrelia will, will migrate to the salivary glands where it's then waiting for the next feeding to get shotting um, with the saliva. So yeah, it's feeding for, for up to uh, like a week, um, gets nice and big, um, and maybe you've seen this if you've like seen a tick on your dog, or hopefully not you, but these ticks will get you know over a hundred times larger, and so they're just imbibing this huge quantity of blood, uh, because they use that blood now, that's their only fuel, their only food, um, that for potentially is up to a year before they have that next blood meal. 
So they take this big uh, feeding, then they molt to the next life stage, and then they, they're using that energy for months and months and months, up to a year, um, while they find, before they find their, their next host at their night, next life stage. So or, I have a question about yeah. the bacteria that's in the saliva that yeah. causes Lyme disease. Is that in the tiniest ticks as well, or is it, or is it picked up along the way? Great question. Yeah, it's picked up along the way. So luckily, um, this bacteria doesn't um, go from the, from the maternal tick through her eggs to the larva. So for um, the Lyme bacteria, most tick-borne diseases, you can't pick them up from the larva. There's a couple unfortunately, that do have this transovarial, like through the egg transmission. Mm -hmm. um, but for most of the tick-borne diseases in this region, the larvae are uninfected. And so then, yeah, they take a blood meal from a mouse and they pick the bacteria up then. Okay. And then these next two life stages are infectious. Mm -hmm. That's so a, yeah, the yeah. ones we get in the spring are the larva, the little tiny <coughs> seed. You can get these larvae now. Um, so this is when they generally hatch, and so we're out sampling, and we're getting we're getting like hundreds and hundreds of larvae per sample. Um, and then if they don't find a host now, then yes, these larvae can overwinter, and you can get them again in the spring. Um, you might also be getting these nymphs in the spring. The nymphs are most active in the spring, early summer. Um, and they're the size of like a, a poppy seed. So it, there's a chance that you just never see the larval ticks. Dave, just to confirm, so male and female have blood males? The male tick actually doesn't have a blood meal. So if you find this male tick on you, it's, it's actually, I mean, sort of gross still, but it's not that bad. What he's looking for is a female tick. And so they mate on host. So what's happening is, he knows the best chance of finding a mate is like finding a deer. And then once he's on the deer, then they, yes, then they use these uh, sex pheromones. He locates her on the deer, they mate on the deer, and then he dies. Um, and so he is not uh, taking a blood meal. You can even see he has these sort of reduced um, uh, mouth parts compared to, uh, compared to the other life stages, yeah. Other questions what, here? What does he eat there? He's not Doesn't eat anything. So he's just going off of the fuel from this blood meal and um, just gonna, like, he knows he's out there. He's gonna look for a host. He's gonna find a host. And then once he's on the host, he's gonna look for a female, mates, and then dies. Is there anything that you can do to mask the carbon dioxide in your game? I don't know. <laughs> uh, you like hold your breath or you wear like a scuba gear or something like that. Um, Definitely people talk about like, I'll go hawking with my, with, with my friend and my friend always gets the ticks and I never get the ticks. And I don't know if that's like, you know, the body temperature differences or carbon dioxide differences or like the way that I walk through the forest, I'm like more casual about <laughs> brushing against things and they're more careful. Um, but it would be a really interesting study to say like, you know, do ticks prefer They've done it with mosquitoes, and mosquitoes definitely do prefer the smell of some people and not other people. So, I should, yeah, it would be a cool study to do. But I don't know any way to mask your 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 carbon dioxide. Okay, so she's uh, yeah, they they've um, the, the ticks are fed up, and they they take a huge blood meal, um, and then for the adult. Female tick, she's going to use that to lay eggs. So this is a really um, amazing picture that um, <laughs> oh, no. there's this um, <laughs> website called all iNaturalist where you can upload, you know, observations you take of all sorts of organisms. But um, someone uploaded this uh, tick that they took off their dog, and then it was just right at the life right stage. Or I'm not sure if she kept it around long enough that then it uh, laid eggs. So here we're seeing this uh, full tick who has now begun to use this blood meal to, to lay eggs. And again, she could lay um, uh, thousands of, of eggs. Where's her head? Her, you know, she, I, I think that they, I'm not exactly sure about this um, anatomy of like what happens when she does the egg laying. Her head is, her like legs are here. And I'm not sure if her like, her head is sort of like tucked down there. Or if she's, I don't think they lay their eggs through their mouth. I think that there's a, a 
poor on the other underside. So yeah, but it's sort of hard to tell what's going on there. Is that inches? What's that? I think this is. That's a good question. If that's <laughs> it's not that's centimeters. I think it's centimeters. It's up there. That one in centimeters. I, I'm not sure. I'll I'll try to figure that out. That's <laughs> Okay. I'm not sure if that's. Uh -oh. oh no no no! I'm sorry. Maybe. I, oh. I, I We had it just at the right spot, and now we made it. Sorry. Does that help or hurt? No, that's perfect. Okay. <laughs> Question on that picture: Are the legs shriveling up, or is that something? Else? This is grass. Yeah. Um, the legs are. I, I think that's even grass here. The legs are just here and here. So once they get all big like that, yeah, the you know the, the relative size of the tick compared to the legs gets quite small. And they don't. At that point, they're not very mobile. They're like pretty. Wherever they fall off the deer, that's that's it. So is there just one opening into their body, or are there two? Um, no, she does. They do have um, an anal pore on the underside of the tick. Yeah. Uh -huh. Any other questions here? How many eggs did you say? Up to, up to 3,000 eggs for this species of tick, yeah. But it does depend on sort of like how good that blood meal is and, and some other like environmental conditions. Does temperature have anything to really Yeah, so we're going to talk about the role that temperature plays here, yeah. And um, we know that there are other ticks that carry tick-borne diseases. Um, is a lot of the information you're sharing about the colored um, deer tick uh, similar to the other ticks that carry tick Yes, a lot of this is similar. So I'm, we're going to get in, to, in the next section to some specifics that really is going to apply best to Borrelia in, in the deer tick. But um, so far, this, this information is pretty, pretty general and would apply to other tick-borne diseases. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so now we will um, transition here and talk about the specific ecology of the black-legged tick. And again, to motivate this, we can think about just um, how Lyme disease cases uh, have changed in the Northeast over the last uh, uh, two decades. So these are data from the CDC where they get Lyme disease counts and then they share them um, at the county level. So what we're, this color scale here is how many cases of Lyme disease there are per year per 10,000 residents of a county. So the darkest colors here are 40, and they go down to 10. Um, and these data are very um, underreported. So the true number of cases is is um, is probably quite high, much higher. But this still gives a nice visual of of where these cases used to be. So two decades ago, um, Lyme disease was predominantly found in southern New England, and then sort of like coastal mid-Atlantic states. Um, this reflects, you know, where Lyme disease was originally uh, described in, in Lyme, Connecticut, coastal Connecticut, um, and then uh, the disease sort of had, was predominantly thought of as, as again, like this mid-Atlantic, coastal, southern New England disease. Um, and this sort of reflects many people's lived experiences up here where you don't have a lot of friends who've gotten Lyme disease, you don't have a lot of ticks on you. I grew up in Vermont in the 80s and 90s and I, you know, I was in the woods a lot and never found any ticks or had any ticks. Um, but then over the last um, 20 years there's been this dramatic increase in the number of Lyme disease cases and sort of increase in the geographic range. And so now the places where we find the most Lyme disease cases are, you know, more like coastal Maine, southern Vermont, I mean, and definitely we have a lot of it up here as well. And then, uh, interestingly, places in sort of western uh, um, Pennsylvania. There's clearly like state reporting biases too. So I mean, I think we should take like why is Pennsylvania so much higher than if you just go across the the, the line into New York or across into Ohio. Um, and that they didn't actually didn't have any data from Massachusetts. So um, some of this, you know, there's clearly reporting differences in different states, but um, it clearly reflects a, 
a big change in uh, where we find Lyme disease. And again, we, we can experience this in our lived experiences too. If you've been here for the last two decades, you've seen this increase in the number of ticks, in the number of uh, your friends or yourselves who have um, contracted Lyme disease. Uh, and so this really motivates my research. Why is this? What is responsible for this big change in the incidence of this disease? Um, and the most obvious answer is that you know we've had this new tick that we didn't have before, which was its vector. So then the sort of secondary question is, what's responsible for the changes in the population of black legged ticks? Uh, and so in order to answer that, we want to put this tick in its sort of like ecological web of interactions. Um, so again, black legged tick or the deer tick, um, like all of these hard body ticks, it has these three life stages and takes a single blood meal at each life stage. Um, and it transmits many human diseases, again, because it's this generalist, it's feeding on a mouse, and then the next life stage, it's feeding on a person. Um, it can transmit any pathogens that was in that mouse to us. Um, and so Lyme disease is the most common, but anaplasmosis is a, another uh, increasingly common tick-borne disease in this region caused by uh, bacteria. Um, and then there's some other <coughs> rarer ones, um, uh, but that can also be found around here. And the important thing to know is that these nymphs are actually the main culprit for spreading diseases to humans. So we think about, you know, we've probably, off, most people have seen adult an adult tick and sort of know what it looks like, and then removed it from themselves. Uh, got that tick off of you before it's feeding or quickly while it's feeding. Um, but these nymphs are much smaller, much easier to miss, and could, you know, and so unfortunately that means they could be feeding on us w without us knowing as well. Um, and then as a result, they're the ones that are spreading uh, diseases to us uh, more often. And then luckily the larvae aren't usually infectious. And so with larval, if they do feed on us, we really don't have to worry about it. Um. Excuse me. Uh, you said from the mouse to the human, when it gets full, does it just drop off of the mouse? Yeah, when it gets full. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going to see sort of a, a, a diagram of a life cycle and that'll help us visualize it. Yes, but when it fills up off of a, a host, just drops right off. <laughs> and wherever that is, just hangs out there and waits, molts to the next life stage. Once it's ready, then it will host, look for the next host pretty close to right there because it doesn't crawl around very much. So yeah, these nymphs are responsible for most uh, tr disease transmission to humans. Um, you know, it's, it's very easy to, it's relatively easy to see the adults. Some people say like, okay, the adult is about the size of a sesame seed, but the nymph is about the size of a poppy seed. So that's often the sort of um, messaging that people use. And so this is uh, including the CDC <laughs> that uses this messaging. And so in order to drive it home, they put a bunch of nymphal ticks onto a poppy seed muffin and they're like oh can you notice the poppy seed versus the tick and so you like zoom in from this projector you can't really see it but if you saw the real image you could see like that's a tick and that's a poppy seed but it's very hard to tell the difference um, but it's pretty gross um, but i think effective uh messaging to to drive the point home Okay, so this, this I think will help visualize uh, this life cycle and sort of what's happening in between the life stages. Again, sort of a simplified diagram, but we see these three feedings and, and the hosts that were happen happening. So we'll just quickly talk about this, this life cycle where the eggs hatch and the ticks are living now on, on the forest floor uh, or on the vegetation on the ground. Um, and then they will do this host seeking where they'll sort of climb up some vegetation wave those two arms around and then um, anything that passes by they'll grab onto uh, then they'll be on the host and they'll search around on the host find like a little micro site where they'll feed so often on deer on mice and deer it's like on the ears there's more uh, vascularization there's more blood uh, vessels it's a thinner thinner um, skin it's harder for the adult for the animal to groom off on the ears um, and so then they'll feed there um, and then once they're done feeding and they're full they just drop right off and wherever they are they just will then um, hang out on the forest floor right there 
um, molt to the next life stage and, and do it again. Uh, generally, as the life stages progress, they're going for bigger and bigger um, bodied animals. Um, some of this is because you know, um, these ticks will, won't crawl quite as high up on vegetation, and so they really are low. And so a mouse passing by is getting it a lot more than like a deer hoof passing by. Um, and then additionally, these, ad these adults, they need a, a, a large quantity of blood to really get big like that. And they also are looking for something where they're likely to find a mate. So they are really keying in on the biggest body hosts. So humans, dogs, and then really deer. Deer are thought to be the, you know, the main host of this adult life stage, which is why it's called, called the deer tick. Uh, uh, the other thing to say is just this life cycle takes about three years, so the larvae are most likely to be out in late summer. Um, they'll feed, drop off, and then over winter. Uh, and then the nymphs come out the next spring or summer. Then these are feeding, again, um, uh, potentially on small mammals, but then also on dogs or, or people, um, and drop off here in summer. Uh, then develop the adults come out in the fall. So often these adults are found, you know, quite late in the fall. Feed, drop off, and then um, uh, overwinter and lay their eggs in the following summer. Uh, and then that that gets these larvae back out in sort of late summer. So we have these two overwintering, so it can last between a full like three years. Yeah. Do we know how many of the uh, eggs then end up being larvae, and then of that larvae, how many survive? So how many survive yep. each stage? It's not very many, because they lay 2,000 eggs. So you can think about like if, if the population is not growing, then when you lay 2,000 eggs, when two, a pair of ticks lays 2,000 eggs, then of those 1,000 eggs, or, um, only two of them are going to survive so that the population isn't increasing exponentially. Maybe it is, but so probably what's happening is you have like, you know, only 10% of them survive and only 10% of them survive and then only, you know, 20% of them survive so that, um, and so the strategy is lay thousands and thousands of eggs because actually it's sort of hard for these like tiny little ticks to find a host and for it to work out. Um, and, Exactly, and then getting on a tick, and that tick has like, yeah. And is it possible for us like to step on a nest of? <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> you can. <laughs> um, what the nests are are effectively um, so these they're not nesting together this tick, but where the eggs are laid, those ticks don't move very far, and so you can get. We call it sometimes like a larva bomb. And so you go through, and then there's hundreds of larvae on you. Um, fortunately, then, these life stages are now spread out. Because then they get on a mouse, and the mouse is like running around and running around. And so the, the nymphs aren't like all clustered together in one space uh, as much. Is it known who eats the eggs and the larvae? Yeah, so that's a great question because we want to think about this yeah. like web of interactions. The greatest thing would be if we have some like yeah, some, some predators of these. Um, so uh, some birds will eat these. So you can think about like people talk about guinea ha guinea fowls or chickens that are like pecking away and will eat them, and they're pretty good uh, at eating them. Um, some spiders and some millipedes are very good like. Uh, predators in the leaf litter layer. Um, there's some fungal diseases that the ticks can get. So if it actually gets way too wet, then these fung then it's good for fung fungi to spread. Um, and that's a biocontrol that's been used or tested where you spray these fungal spores. Um, there's some nematodes that will eat the eggs. Uh, there's a wasp that is like a parasite of, of ticks, the way that you know sometimes you can have these parasitic wasps of, uh, of other arthropods. Um, there's no like real great predators of them, unfortunately. Um, this diagram shows uh, where on the ground and on plants you might find ticks. And so you're showing the forest floor. Yeah. So that's leaves, uh, leaf matter, and you're showing grasses. 
um, what other types of plants and how high up from the ground might you find ticks? Yeah, so these ticks are less likely to be found in, like, in the middle of a lawn or, or grass. Um, they have this grass in the picture. I don't, I don't love that. There's other tick species that are more likely, like, in the middle of very grassy areas. Um, they like the, the, the leaf litter layer to not dry out or to be too sunny. And so they're more likely to be found in a forest, in the leaf litter of a forest. Um, but then once you're in the forest, they will like climb up on a fern or a seedling, um, or the adults more will climb up on like a shrub. And so if you have sort of like a shrubby opening in a forest, like a power line cut or whatever, then you could like walk through that and then the adults will be higher up on like shrubby areas to get onto a deer. Um, uh, so any sort of vegetation that's growing uh, on the forest floor or then like sort of in this ecotone or this transition zone from a forest to a field that the, the tick will sort of like bleed out into the field as well. So going back to the predators, somebody told me once said a possum. Oh yeah, we'll talk about a possum. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you show um, winter time and uh, what you said so far is that the ticks winter over. There's been a lot of information that at first, if you're hiking in winter below you know, a certain temperature, um, there are no ticks out. And now we need to take precaution year round. So how is it that um, they are looking for us in the winter? Yes, so the adult can be active at quite cold temperatures. So um, they'll hatch in Again, in, in the fall, because these these ticks are have been have fed, you know, in in the summer, and it takes them a little while to develop. They're going to hatch around October, November, um, but they can be active above. I would say maybe like like just above freezing. So like when it down to like forty degrees Fahrenheit or like four or five degrees Celsius, um, I I can think they'd be active. Um, and if there's no snow on the ground. I think if there's snow on the ground, the ticks are below the snow, and I mean, maybe sometimes you'll find one, but I would say mostly if it's below freezing and there's no, and, or there's snow on the ground, I think you're safe from ticks. But if you have like a thaw in February, the snow melts and it gets up to 50, and you're in the woods, you could, you could pick up an, a, an adult tick. So they are then, yeah, if they don't find a host in, in that, uh, that fall, they'll overwinter and they'll come out the next spring. And so uh, you, could, you can find them then. Or again, if it's a, a, a late winter and it's like December and it's 50 and it hasn't snowed yet, um, I think you could get a tick, you could get a tick in the woods. So yeah, unfortunately with warmer uh, seasons, it does just extend that tick season. Okay, so we're going to use this uh, diagram to sort of think about this question of like what, what drives black-legged tick population size. So why are the black-legged tick populations bigger now than before? Why do we find them here and we didn't find them before? And we're going to break it up into two uh, two sort of broad groups of, of drivers, of, of mechanisms. Um, and the one is the host community. So depending on, you know, if you had a lot of mice, this gets to this question of like, okay, what, what fraction of larvae are actually successful? Well, it depends on how many mice there are out there. If there's tons and tons of mi mice, like 100 mice in this little forest, they're all running around, then a lot more of these larvae are gonna find a host. Versus if for whatever reason this forest doesn't have many mice in it, um, then these larvae are out there looking and they never find a host and, they, and they're gonna die, that little energy reserve they're gonna have, they're gonna exhaust it before they find a host. Um, and then importantly also for deer, if you've got a lot of deer, there's these adults out there um, and each adult could lay like 2,000 eggs and so every one of those adults that finds a deer could really pump up the population of ticks. And so if you have more deer, you have the possibility of feeding a lot more adults and 
them laying a lot more eggs. And so one of the big drivers is just going to be, you know, how many, the size of the populations of those hosts. Um, but in addition to that, the composition of the host community is also important. And here we can use the possums as this great uh, uh, example where when a possum gets a tick, they're very, very good groomers. And they will find that tick off of themselves and then eat it. And so when, if you have a lot of opossums in your woods, there's the possibility they're out there and they're like hoovering up all of the ticks in the area. And so, yeah, maybe there's a lot of opossums out there and they could, you know, lots of ticks could feed on them. But actually, no, these opossums are very um, uh, good at, at, at stopping the ticks from feeding. So uh, a mouse is sort of the opposite end. Almost every map tick that gets on a, on a, on a deer mouse um, this like forest mice will find a spot to feed, feed to completion, and drop off. And so there's differences in each of these different sort of woodland species that we have in how good they are at feeding ticks. Maybe because they have different immune response to the ticks, or because they're better or as groomers, um, or just aspects of their biology. Um, another thing is that these, all of these animals are in their own food web. And so this sort of gets extra complicated about, you know, a tick could feed on any of these different animals, but they're embedded in their own food web. And so maybe ticks will feed on a bunch of red foxes, and a red fox is a good host for a ticks, but mostly what the red fox is doing is it's eating tons of mice. And the more red foxes you have in your woods, then the fewer mice you have. And so he might be feeding some ticks, but ultimately, the effect on the tick population is going to be very, very negative because removing all those mice which would have fed the ticks. And so this is where the ecology of it can get complicated because now we're thinking about the ecology of the vertebrates in, in our forests and what determines the number of mice that we find. And is it based on their food resources uh, or is it based on their predators? Um, or sometimes their predators can have, um, can be outcompeted by other predators. So there's this idea out there that coyotes are very good at uh, uh, keeping away foxes and bobcats because the coyotes are territorial, they're larger than a fox or bobcat, but the coyote itself doesn't want to eat a mouse um, because it's just too small for a coyote. Um, so some people have suggested this sort of a, a chain of interactions where if you have a lot of coyotes they're excluding these other important predators and then that actually helps the mouse population which helps the tick population um, so uh, yeah okay the other thing that could drive these black legged tick populations is their experience off the host so this life cycle here can take up to three years they're feeding on the host for up to a week, and they've got these three weeks when they're feeding on the host, but the rest of that time they're living off the host. They're living here on the forest floor. Um, and here's where temperature and other aspects can really affect the tick. So what happens off the host? So we can think about two sort of things that are mostly happening off the host. They're going out to do their host seeking. Um, and we, we, there's a special word which we use, which is called questing, which is sort of a funny way that we refer to host seeking behavior. So this is a questing tick. Um, she has climbed up on this little maple seedling and she's waving around her um, first two arms, hoping someone would, will come by. Thigh. When a tick is out questing, she's exposed uh, to the air, which is m very dry from the point of view of a tick. And these ticks, uh, surprisingly can dry out really, really quickly. <clears throat> so what she does is she goes, she quests, and then um, walks back down the, the, the vegetation, down to the leaf litter, and to the bottom of the leaf litter where it stays wet all the time. And she just absorbs water back through her skin in this humid microclimate. So one thing that really affects ticks is um, how, how dry it is. And if it dries out, if the leaf litter dries out, then they can just desiccate and die. Or if it, the air is just very dry, then they can't spend as much time host seeking, questing, um, because they're down in the leaf litter more uh, looking for a host. So um, 
a very dry spring, particularly, you can knock back a, a tick population. And then the other thing that affects these ticks is temperature. And so this, this was this question about how, how the temperature affects ticks. And this is largely going to determine their development rate. So how fast do they develop from one life stage to the next? So they fed as a, as a larva, they drop off. How quickly does it then molt to a nymph? Um, and that development happens faster at warmer temperatures. Um, and so that's why they can complete their life cycle um, faster in, in South Carolina than here. Um, or maybe that, you know, 40 years ago, it was co so cold, it was cold enough here that that life cycle was just too hard to complete. Uh, and so this is where um, potentially climate change can play a role. Okay. Any questions? Uh, yeah. uh, maybe this is the time to ask the question. I've been wondering why in, I don't know if you're familiar with the state of Wisconsin, but northern Wisconsin yeah. by the UP as compared to Door County, which yeah. is by the UP. No ticks in Door County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oneida County, you can't walk and get without yeah. putting thousands on you. And, and they have basically the same temperatures. Yep, yeah. It's not climate change yep. unless it affects the host, yep. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's a, that's a very interesting question about, you know, the, the climate change is also affecting the deer and the mice, and so right. it might not be directly on the animals. Um, yeah, if you look at the, the, the uh, Great Lakes distribution of Lyme disease, it is very interesting and localized, and I'm not sure why that is. It, my guess would be something about, like, either deer populations or... Well, Deer County would be mostly, like, rock. Yeah. And Oneida would be a lot of sand yeah. and leaf litter. So yeah. maybe it's because Yeah, um, something about the forest. Exactly. Yeah. And the, yeah, that thickness of the leaf litter can be important. Yeah. I'm I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Well yeah. I'm just thinking about the different I'm yeah. not that town not those places specifically, but why would you have such a difference at this basically yeah. the same latitude? Yeah. Yep, yeah. And very interesting ecological interactions that can that can affect it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question about the host animals. And yeah. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. So if the pathogens are not uh, passed on through the egg, yeah. do the uh, different host animals come up in what way? Yes, this is a great point. And so I, I didn't mention this. These different host animals are also, in addition to being differentially good sort of like feeders of the tick, they're also differentially good reservoirs of the disease. So a squirrel is a very good at feeding ticks. Any tick that gets on a squirrel will feed up just as well as on a mouse. But for whatever reason, squirrels don't get Borrelia very well. And so when a tick feeds on a squirrel, it gen generally isn't infected with Borrelia. Um, so these ticks all, or these hosts also have differential competency as a reservoir for Borrelia. Um, the Borrelia exists in is and maintained in a cycle between ticks and predominantly mice um, and so it's hard to tell in this diagram because this is sort of like the the cycle of the tick population but not through time and so what happens is the nymphs emerge first and the nymphs are coming out in the spring and early summer and they have already been an, a, a larva and have already fed and these nymphs then spread Borrelia to um, the mouse and chipmunk population. Uh, then later in the summer, um, the next cohort of larvae come out. And then these larvae then are feeding on the same mice that the previous cohort of nymphs have already fed on. And then they larvae then pick it up and then the Borrelia spends the winter in the larval ticks as they molt to a nymph and then they come out next year and now the nymphs are feeding on the small mammals and so it goes through this cycle of spending some time in the uh, 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 on a small mammal and then jumping from the small mammal to the next cohort of ticks and then that tick overwinters and then it comes out next year and spreads it to new small mammals um, and so it's it's, it's what's called an enzootic cycle. So endemic would be a disease that's in people. Enzootic means it's, it's in animals, and it's persisting in this cycle between ticks and small mammals. 
And it relies on the fact that these nymphs are feeding earlier in the year than the larvae so that they can sort of spread the disease to a, a new population of mice. Okay, so now we'll talk about my research. We have this background. Um, and so obviously my question is what are the biotic and abiotic factors that drive tick density and infection rate? So, you know, why do we find um, more ticks in some places than other places? Why do we, are some of them infected more than in others? And then use this as a way to sort of say, well, then what's changed? Why are things different now than before? Or why are they different in these two counties in Wisconsin that aren't that different that explains why, you know, we have very different populations of ticks? Um, and so now I've sort of trans, we talked about the biotic factors. This is the living factor. So this is sort of like the host community. And then abiotic is like the temperature um, and the climate. So what, what is explaining these differences in the number of ticks? So yeah, I do my research all here in Addison County. And in order to get these sort of differences in abiotic factors, I, I really leveraged elevation. And so as you go up higher in the mountains, it gets colder. So the snowball is a very different uh, climate than you know here in, in, in town. Um, and these forests are actually very different here. So some forests here on Snake Mountain uh, or Chitman Hill or little forest fragments sort of scattered throughout the valley versus these forests that are in the, the Green Mountain National Forest. So what we do is we go and we sample for ticks using this method, very simple method called drag cloth sampling. So this is one of my former students, uh, Sebastian, dragging this cloth along the ground. The ticks are questing, and then they'll just grab anything that paths by. So even though this isn't warm, it's not extruding any carbon dioxide, that motion is enough for them to grab on. And then we check the drag cloth uh, every 10 meters, and we count the number of ticks that are found off it, on it. Eventually, they would drop off the drag cloth. They would crawl around. They'd be like, where's the warm spot? Where's the carbon dioxide? I'm like, wait a minute. Even though it's moving, <laughs> but as long as we check it often enough, we're, we're getting those questing ticks. Uh, and so we've conducted this tick sampling at these uh, sites that I showed you for the last uh, seven years. Um, so then you've got to be really carefully looking for the ticks. Luckily, the drag cloth is white, so the, the ticks will sort of uh, stick out. Um, and so there's a nymphal tick next to my finger. So then we bring the ticks back to the lab, and we do a molecular assay to test for whether the tick is infected um, with the Lyme disease agent. We also test for some of the other uh, tick-borne pathogens, but the focus here is mostly the Lyme disease agent. So we crush up the ticks and we extracted their DNA, and then we do a PCR test. So just like you could get a PCR test for the, the, the virus that causes um, COVID-19, uh, we're gonna sort of just selectively amplify some DNA that's only found in the Borrelia genome, uh, and then we run this on a gel, and then we only have bands on the ticks where we have D DNA amplified, and so that's the way we can tell whether the ticks are infected. Okay, so what do we find? The most striking pattern is that as you go up in elevation, we find many, many fewer ticks. Um, so these are these points represent the average number of ticks uh, nymphs that we find when we do a drag of we do a, a drag cloth sample of 200 meters. So how many ticks do we find? And then this line is sort of a measure of the variation around that average. So. At these low elevation sites in the Champlain Valley, we find maybe between 10 and 20 ticks per sample. Uh, we go up to about like 250 meters of elevation, um, and we're down to like half that, uh, uh, five ticks per 200 meters. And then once we get above, above 400 meters, it's sort of hard to see, but these numbers are much lower than one tick per 200 meters. And the highest site we sample is up at the snow bowl and up there we find like 50 times fewer ticks in the snow bowl than like if we were sampling on Chipman Hill or around the TAM. Um, so we have really dramatic differences in the number of ticks uh, in different regions just, you know, between here and the snow bowl. <clears throat> we also find uh, quite dramatic differences year to year. So this is a, a little bit more of a busy graph, but we'll just ignore 
this part here. We'll just look at this. And so what we're showing is the seven years that we've sampled for ticks. And this is the way that, that sometimes we want to display data where we show the average and then the sort of like most 50% of the data fall in this range. So again, it's a way to show sort of the variation and then the absolute extremes. So this is uh, a way to sort of show not only the average data, but the, the range of data. So what we can see in this case is at these low elevation sites, we have these alternating like high and low years. So 2016, we found about 10 ticks per sample, but then 2017, we found like 20 ticks per sample. Then it went down to maybe like three, back up to 12, very few ticks in 2020, and then uh, 15 here in 2021, and then this year was another sort of low tick year. Um, and the patterns are a little bit harder to see, but they are sort of replicated even at the mid elevation sites, which is like fewer ticks. So, you know, we can have this variation of like twice as many ticks, or then from here to here, maybe four times fewer ticks year to year. So ultimately, I was sort of expecting the number of ticks to be increasing, but I think maybe we're at sort of a sta steady number of ticks, but it just va varies year to year, the number of ticks. And here, I don't really have an answer. What I, I mean, ultimately, I'd like to make this data set long enough that I can say, oh, was it a cold winter that knocked them back? Or did we have more mice this year? And then those mice fed all the larvae, so the next year we had a lot of nymphs. Um, but there's these sort of time lags in the data that make it tricky. If we had a lot of deer here, then that, those deer would make more larvae in this year, and then that would make more nymphs in this year. And so ultimately, the number of nymphs this year is reflecting how many larvae there were last year and how many adults there were the year before. And so there we could have these, in addition to sort of complex ecological interactions, sort of time lags in the, in the interactions. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, 2020 was the year that the COVID started. Would that have any effect on your uh, research? That's a, that's a great point. This summer, usually I have a group of, th of four, three or four students. We're out in the woods together. That summer I couldn't have any students, so I did all this tick sampling alone. So maybe it's just that I'm not as good at tick sampling for ticks as my students. I, I hope that's not the case. I hope that's really reflecting. Maybe we put an asterisk there. I think this is true. I think I'm actually very good at, at finding the ticks. and I use the same methods that I would with my students. Yeah. Could it correlate with dryness or not? It could definitely correlate with dryness. So if these uh, summers are dry, the ticks are less active. And so this is sampling, drag cloth sampling, it's only the ticks that are out there looking for a host. If it's a really dry time, then uh, they might not be sampling. So uh, I, again, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's just how hard because of this complex web of interactions. And if I have enough years, maybe I can find some of those correlates of yeah, dryness or the number of mice. Yeah. Why do you think in higher elevations there's less variation? Yeah. So I think it could just be that there's fewer numbers of ticks. And then um, because of those lower numbers, there's just not as much. Like if, if you're up at 10, sometimes it could be 20. Sometimes it could be 3. But if your average is like 1, then there's just not much range around that 1. And so if, if, if you zoomed in on these, they would there would be more relative variation, but because of the scale, it's sort of being blown out by this one. But it could also be that there's less variation, I'm not entirely sure. So are you displaying ticks in general, or ticks only at the nymph stage? This is just ticks of the nymph stage. And so here, the nymphs are the most important transmitters to humans. So they're often used as sort of the proxy for risk. How many nymphs are there out there at a time? Um, and that's the best proxy for human risk. Um, and I'm also just using it as sort of a static, like okay, I'm just going to use one of the life stages um, to, to, to make the comparison. But the pattern would be the same if I looked at larvae or adults. OK. Uh, and then we also find differences in the, in the rate that those ticks are infected. So again, these are the nymphs. And then we test them, and what we find is that generally, like 20-ish percent of those nymphs are infected with the Lyme agent. Um, but again, not only are the low elevation sites have more ticks, but a larger fraction of those ticks 
are infected. So up here at 20 to 30 percent of the ticks at the low elevation sites uh, carry the Lyme agent, but then once you get up to high elevations, it's like fewer than 20 or um, uh, even uh, less than 10 percent of the ticks are infected. So again, this is just the, the NIMPs, um, uh, uh, their the infection rate. Okay, so the big question is why is this? What's the mechanism that drives this pattern? What's, what's the driver? Is it these abiotic things? As you go up in elevation, it's colder. Um, and so this colder temperature, it could be able to just kill the overwintering ticks if it gets too cold. Or it just could be that the colder temperature leads to this slower development. And so at the snow bowl or you know, even at, at, um, at bread loaf or Riker, like it's cold enough that that development slows down enough that the population just can't really keep going. Um, uh, or that it's, yeah, the, the, the number, the amount of time the ticks have to be active when it's warm enough is just short enough that it keeps the population in check. Do we know that ticks are killed by cold? This probably is not that important, unfortunately. Uh, it has to get very, very, very cold for ticks to die. Um, and if there's any snow, then this snow is a really good insulator and the ticks are below the snow. And so what you would really need in order to kill the ticks from cold, directly from cold temperature is a big cold snap when there's no snow on the ground. Um, uh, so you can kill a tick if you, yeah, in the lab if you would ex get a very, very cold temperature, but probably it's not actually that important in nature. Uh, and so this second one is the, probably the main way the temperature affects tick populations. Uh, okay, the other thing that could affect these tick populations is the, is the host community. Um, and Another big difference as we go from the forests here to the forests, you know, around Breadloaf or, or um, around Riker is that we have very different forest sizes. So in here, the, Sh the Champlain Valley has this uh, agricultural area surrounded by and surrounding smaller forest fragments um, versus this sort of large contiguous forest of the Green Mountain National Forest at, at, at the high elevation site. Um, and there's this idea that more fragmentation tolerant species are also really the best tick hosts. So a white-footed mouse, a deer mouse, uh, or a white-tailed deer. These are ticks or animals that um, are very good at feeding ticks and are very efficient reservoirs of Borrelia. Um, the, the mouse is, uh, and they also are relatively more less sensitive to human activity, uh, they don't mind living in a little forest fragment or going between that forest and a, and a corn field or a hay field um, versus maybe in a larger forest fragment we can support some of the better small mammal predators like foxes or owls or bobcats um, that are that could be more sensitive to human activity and need that larger forest. Um, and so unfortunately both of these things are changing with elevation at the same time. And so ultimately what I'm interested in doing is trying to tease these apart. Uh, try to tease apart the abiotic versus the biotic drivers. Um, and I'll say, you know, just as, as a, to foreshadow, I don't have the answer yet. And so this is the work that I'm sort of ongoing doing now. Um, and I can sort of give you some idea of how, how I figure this out as I, um, like Marita said, try to like figure out which, as we go year to year, why do we have that variation? Or why are there 50 times fewer ticks at the snowball versus down here? Is it just the temperature or are there differences in the host community? So there's two ways I'm trying to do that. One is to directly measure ticks uh, response to these different abiotic conditions. So this is work that I've been working on with my students where we make these little tick enclosures and we keep ticks uh, inside of, we've tried different methods, um, but uh, this, these are these little uh, mesh things that we've sunk into the ground, and then uh, we use this uh, product called Tanglefoot uh, along the outside that's this very sticky substance that the ticks will walk up to, and then they, they won't pass it because they get stuck on it. Um, and then we keep the ticks alive in here and then count their activity when they're questing, or they come back and um, uh, uh, see how many are alive, um, or we do a rain block, or put them under a greenhouse. Um, and so we're trying to directly see how those different 
abiotic conditions and factor checks. <clears throat> it's a little tricky, and we're still sort of working out these methods, um, but some of my students have, have come up with some results of like, okay, well, how cold does it have to be uh, before the, the adults start, start, stop questing? And so this is actually directly related to one of these earlier questions of like, as it heats up, how much more of the ticks are active. The other way is we want to then see what are those hosts that we find at these different sites. Do we actually have different animals at the Snow Bowl, then at Chipman Hill, that could describe those differences in ticks? Uh, so we take two methods here. One, we uh, sample for the um, small mammals using these Sherman Live traps. So we set out these traps uh, during night. That allows us to trap the nocturnal small body mammals. Um, we take a, uh, we tag the animal take a small tissue sample and then count the ticks on it. Um, and then we do this three nights in a row uh, and you can use these mark uh, recapture methods to estimate the population size. Um, so some of the small mammals that we get, mostly these paramiscus mice, there's two species of paramiscus mice, the white-footed mouse and the deer mouse, um, these shrews, so a vole, uh, and every so often, uh, it's pretty cool to get a flying squirrel. Um, so the way that we get those bigger animals is with game cameras or, or camera traps. So you set up these uh, traps, uh, uh, cameras that are motion censored, um, and then um, you can go through the pictures and identify the different images to count, like, okay, how many deer are there at this site uh, versus another site, or do we have bobcats at this site? Do we have coyotes at this site? Can we try to tease apart some of those? interactions, like if we have a lot of coyotes, do we actually have fewer foxes? Um, and then there's methods for trying to, to estimate the sort of like range of view of the camera, and then you count how many animals you get, and you can get a sort of relative density of the animals based on this. Um, so like I said, these uh, are still um, in progress. I'm um, sort of tweaking these methods, and then ultimately we'll be analyzing the data to try to uh, tease these different things apart. So um, right now, I don't have a nice convincing answer, but I could definitely tell you, if you want to go hiking, you know, go up to Breadloaf, hike around there. D the TAM is beautiful, and Chipman Hill are wonderful, but that's where you're going to find the most ticks. Um, <laughs> So I'd like to thank uh, all the wonderful Middlebury College students who have done this work with me. Like, uh, like, like they, you noted, in 2020 I didn't have students, but every other year I've had a big group of students who are out in the field sampling for ticks or in the lab testing the ticks. Uh, I've got some funding from some different sources and then access, uh, thanks to the uh, landowners for accessing their land to sample for the ticks. So I'm happy to stick around, answer some questions, but I'm not sure if I went over time if you need to head out. Yes, I did. Feel free to head out. You have pepper me with questions. Oh, pepper me with questions. <laughs> so the best place to find a tick is on a deer trail? Yeah, a deer trail. Um, or sometimes you can definitely find them in, in dip, so the places where there might be a lot of mice. So if you have like a little wood pile in your, ha uh, or if you go along an old stone wall in a forest, the, de the mice love to live in these old stone walls. And so we, we definitely find these sort of like micro habitats in the, in the forest where, I mean, maybe I'm like projecting, but I'm like, oh, that looks like a mousy spot. And then we find a lot of ticks there because yeah, the ticks are, ref their distribution is reflecting where they fall off a host. So I grew up in the South, and you know we had dog ticks, and and I I remember seeing them as a little girl doing this. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know what this was yeah. called. Yeah. And backing up into you know we had cat. I grew up on a farm, but backing up and then watching the just just baby ticks just crawl mm -hmm. all over my legs. Yeah. You know backing yeah. up to a a big yeah. tall Johnson grass. But anyway, you know, we had these ticks, and Daddy would get me a little 
We call them big old dog ticks. Yeah. But I never knew anybody that got sick. So yeah, luckily dog ticks don't transmit Lyme disease. Um, I heard a rot at Rocky Mountain spotted tick fever. Exactly. So this is a. But never. Yeah. Then, but so when did Lyme disease become a thing? And were these other diseases around, or are they? Were they there? Yeah. And yep. We just didn't know. Yeah. We didn't hear yeah. about them. Are they really new? Yeah. Yep. That, that's my question. Yeah. Is, is this yep. has always bothered me? Yeah. That I grew up with ticks being ubiquitous. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But nobody ever got sick. Yeah. Yeah. So in the South, you have some different species of ticks. There's the Lone Star right. tick. Right. You have the dog tick, and these are different. Um, group families of ticks, different genera, uh, that are, uh, and only the Ixodes genus can transmit Lyme disease. Okay. And so we have other species in that genus um, that transmit Lyme disease in Europe, and in Asia, and in Western United States. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think this is a really tricky question. Lyme disease was described in the in the mid seventies. Um, mid seventies. So, so in Lyme, Connecticut, there was this outbreak of um, really horrible juvenile arthritis. And so these little kids were all getting arthritis in these little clusters, and they didn't know what it was. Um, and they eventually were able to tie it to a tick, and then a little while later, they found this bacteria in the tick. Um, and so, yeah, Lyme disease can get really bad in your joints. And so these kids had really, really horrible, untreated cases of Lyme disease. Um, since then, in the medical literature, you can go back and you can find some things where you say, like, oh, this is clearly describing Lyme disease. So from the 1800s in Wisconsin and from the 1800s in um, Austria or Germany, um, there's descriptions of what is clearly Lyme disease. And then you can go back into museum specimens and you can test ticks, you can test mice, and there's mice that had Borrelia from the 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, and then they even found a preserved um, human from 2,000 years ago in Europe, and they found Lyme disease, Borrelia in this, in this person. So. Um, uh, Lyme disease has been around for a long time, uh, but we've only described it since the 70s, and then we only found the agent that caused it in the I 70s. See. And then clearly there's been this increase in the number of Lyme disease cases, and we really, how much of that is climate, how much of that is, probably what happened was we chopped down all the woods, and we killed all the deer, um, white people, when we came to, 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 to North America. Uh, um, and the tick populations crashed um, because there was no forest and there was no deer. And for some reason, they sort of, you know, moved to these coastal regions. And so they were found now on Long Island, on Block Island, on Fire Island. There, this is where uh, we have these historic records of of, uh, of the ticks um, that were infected and mice that were infected, and then with reforestation and increases to deer populations, probably that has spread the range where ticks could, could be. And so um, that's, that's, that's the story for the deer tick. Um, some of the other diseases, it, yeah, it gets trickier. Um, yeah. Thanks. And I assume that moose don't carry the Yes, yeah, this is a great point. Yeah, the, the the winter tick or the moose tick is is again it's another species of ticks. It's closely related to the to the dog tick, um, mm -hmm. um, and that's a tick that has a different biology where it's a it's it doesn't drop off between feeding, and so it gets on one host, mm -hmm. and then it feeds as a larva, yeah. and then it then feeds as a nymph, it and then it feeds as an adult. It sounds yeah. so much more reasonable if you're the tick. Like, once you find something, it's horrible for the moose. Um, but as a result, it doesn't transmit diseases because it's only feeding on one animal through its whole life. Um, but it can build up those big populations. And that, yeah, that moose will walk through a, a tick bomb of like thousands of larvae uh, and then pick up all those um, ticks. Most creatures provide something. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to work out what this what ticks provide. 
What is their purpose? Yep. We know yep. we provide what food is, for various purposes. Yep. Yep. What, are we, what are we learning about the positive aspect? <laughs> Amen. I think it's a good question. I, I don't know. Maybe they are enough of a burden on a mouse population that they keep mouse populations in, in check. Um, there are some specialized like fungus that will only attack a tick. And there's this wasp that she only lays her eggs in ticks. And she's a parasite of, wa of just ticks. So there's very specialized predators or parasites of ticks. Um, so maybe that's what they're providing, but obviously, you know, we did just fine 30 years ago here without ticks. Our woods were not missing something. Um, so I, I think it's a tricky question of almost philosophically, like, you know, what is, does every organism have a, a purpose or not? I'm not sure. Yeah. I was talking about Wisconsin and the difference between the two counties, but even in Vermont, you go to Orleans County, yeah. there's no ticks. Yep, yep, the yep. Northeast Kingdom. Right, yeah. yeah. but if you go south of Woodsville, yeah. they're everywhere. <laughs> so I don't know, if there's yep. something, and so what's the difference between Addison County and Orleans County? Yep, yeah. Is it just cold enough? Is that the difference? No, because in Wisconsin, in, in, yep. in yeah. Oneida County, it gets to be 45 below zero yep. all yeah. the time. Yeah. So I, it's not, it's yeah. not I think it has to do with something about the host community. I like, think it does too. Are, for some reason, there's fewer mice or um, Maybe they have fewer more, deer. More foxes. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. and the wild, they had more moose, so that would keep the deer out. More, yeah. Right? And, well, no, that would be further east. Oh, that was yeah. further yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. It's, interesting it's right a now. great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what got you interested in tea? You know, it was that I came back here. I grew up in Springfield um, in the 80s and 90s, and then I got this job at Middlebury and was out in the woods. I was, I'm, I was originally a forest ecologist. I was looking for sites to set up my forest plots, and um, but I was like covered with ticks, and I was like, what oh is this? Why is this? I don't remember <laughs> any ticks growing up, and so it felt like, oh, I've got to study this, you know? So. Thank you. Well, this is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.